hello, ladies and gentlemen and doctors. This is Scott McDonald at Dr. Demographics, and we often talk about the perfect place to put a practice or things that you want to know about the demographics in the area or trends that are happening in the United States. Well, we're going to be dealing with some of these things, all of these things in this uh, session today. We are going to talk about immigration. Now, you probably know that we've had a dip during the COVID pandemic on birth rate. So people aren't having as many children in most parts of the United States. Now, I happen to live in Utah, which is the highest birth rate in the country. And there are places like Arizona and Texas, certainly parts of Florida that are holding their own, definitely. But for the vast majority, they're having to depend upon other people who are moving into the area in order to make a successful patient base. How can we make the place we're in serve a larger audience? And how can we make that audience more loyal to us? Now, our topic today is on taking advantage of the trends that we're noticing in the immigration. Now, look, there's a lot of reasons to make immigration a big deal. During the Biden administration, there has been a significant increase in the amount of immigration to the country, some of it legal. Some of it, not so much. Now, I am not going to talk about the morality or the practicality of the federal government's participation in getting more people here in, in the United States. I will, however, say my tendency is to favor immigration because it helps practices and it helps businesses. But I can also see it being a net drain on the economies of certain states like Texas and Florida have suffered a lot because they're trying to fund a lot of illegal immigrants. And they're also dealing with the front line of several criminal issues. I'm not going to deal with that today. I'm just going to talk about how immigration can affect your practice and how to take advantage of it if this is one of the things that you think you need. Now, Dr. Demographics is all about knowing where to move, start a business or practice, promote your efforts, and get the most out of your location. Our job is to deal with the where issues. Now, it is definitely true the United States has entered into a new age of immigration. There are far larger numbers of people coming to the United States. Now, a couple of reasons why. Obviously, with a new administration that is more lenient on keeping our borders open, and they do this often with the hope that they're going to increase the number of voters that are loyal to their party. Let's face it, that is one reason. There are other factors in which people are looking for people to work in their businesses because as a result of the pandemic, a lot of people have felt like they don't need to work, they've already got money, and so major employers are desperate to find people to work. So immigration is a natural source for those people to come in. So I get all that. That's true. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to help in your practice. I want to deal with the issues of choosing and using an immigrant population to come in as your patient base primarily. Now, the biggest immigration changes most recently are Mexico and Central America. You know, that they can come up the road, knock on the gate and say, hey, we want to come in. And there has been a movement among Hispanic politicians to say, yeah, let them in, because they see that as a source of their benefit. But I also want to tell you that's a mixed blessing, because as we talk about the Hispanic population, a significant number of people are Cuban and Haitian, and they are largely Republican. And then, of course, we have Mexico, which is mixed. It hasn't been reliably a Democrat group. And during this last election, they came out in very large numbers to support the more conservative candidates. So, you know, people have to think pretty long and hard about whether or not immigration is going to help their short term political efforts. But Mexico and Central America are definitely have sent people here. Now, I don't know, you know, I've worked extensively with Hispanics. I used to live in Central America, and I've seen a lot of these patterns, so I'll share with you with what I know. There is a new source of immigrants in the United States. Taiwan is likely to all of a sudden turn like a spigot in which people are going to start coming from Taiwan. Why? Because China has made threats to invade them. Hong Kong, which used to be pretty much a, an independent nation under the British rule, has now become a fully integrated part of China, or at least is moving in that direction. And then, of course, there's China. Now, a lot of people assume the Chinese are going to stay in China. 
Well, immigration experts are saying no. A very large percentage of people from China are trying to do everything they can to get their children out of the country and also to get their assets out of China because they're not making any money on their investments, or at least it's much more restricted in China. So Taiwan, Hong Kong, and China are going to be increasingly large sources. Now, we've already had a large number of people come from, say, the Philippines. That goes back to World War II. But it has been a consistent source of immigration in the United States. Now, recently, of course, you've heard all about Afghanistan. You're probably going to see something where people come from Afghanistan on plane loads and the government doesn't know what to do with them. They're going to let them in the streets and say, hey, stay out of the bushes, just, you know, get to work. Now, Afghanistan is one source of pretty reliable workforce. But there are others that are coming up that nobody talks about. And one of those is Africa. Africa, Northern Africa, Central Africa, and Southern Africa really have a lot of fairly well-educated English-speaking people who want to get out of the continent. They're not earning very much money. And whenever that happens and there are jobs available, people come. As they were looking at the statistics on people crossing the southern border of the United States, bordered with Mexico, Africa had a very large number and percentage of people who were coming in. Why? Because it's easy to get into Mexico and Central America from Africa. It's not a one you know, step thing, but they they do tend to come in in that direction. Now, you may be asking, well, I've heard of other places where the population is rather desperate, educated, or whatever, and they will probably want to come to America as well. And these countries will include Russia, Japan, the Middle East, India, and Indonesia. Now, let me explain something about each of those. Japan and Russia have something in common, and that is a significant decline in birth rate very big. So there's not much reason for people to want to pick up and move to the United States from Japan when employment is pretty full, easier to stay local, and have the cultural benefits. Russia doesn't have that, but it does have an association with education, and so a lot of people have come from Russia. Problem is, their birth rate has really declined significantly, almost as bad as Japan. When the birth rate goes down, well, Immigrants aren't as numerous, and there's not as much pressure on the United States as to take them. The Middle East was predicted to have a huge number of births, and so we were always going to come in with large numbers of Palestinians and Egyptians. Did it happen? The answer is no, it did not. There is the closing of the Muslim womb, is what the experts have referred to it as. So we don't expect to see as many from the Middle East, with the exception of one big country. Israel. Israel has been going through a baby boom. And with the proliferation of English in the Middle East in Israel, and a lot of people who are happy to take in those people who are Israelis, they look like they may become a rising source of increase in population in the United States. What about India? Well, India is a huge, well, in fact, the largest democracy in the world in terms of numbers. So you'd think, well, India would be terrific. A large number of of Indian speakers, employers would find it's easier to go to India and set up the business and telemarket into the United States and Canada. So India doesn't look like it's going to be as big a source as people thought to send people here. Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world, which a lot of people forget. Getting to the United States from Indonesia is nearly impossible. So that's not likely to happen, at least not anytime soon. Now, in absolute numbers, the United States has the largest immigrant population than any other country, with about 47 million immigrants since 2015. And by now, it's probably closer to 100 and, well, let's just say it's over 50 or 60 million. I mean, there's a lot of wiggle room there that are coming to the United States. Why? Well, It represents 19.1% of the 244 million international immigrants worldwide. That's a lot of people. The United States has the ability and the inclination to take people from nations all over the earth. And with so many people already living here who speak their native languages and have an access to their culture, the United States is terrific. But 
But remember, the world economy shows that Europe is not growing. Its economy is kind of in the tank. Nobody particularly wants to pick up and move to China, even though, yeah, it's got a big employment. People don't receive very much in wages. So they're coming to the United States, and that is the golden ticket everybody's looking for. Now, because of President Biden being in office, it's expected that the immigration to the United States is going to increase. Interestingly enough, people thought Canada was going to increase, but Canada kind of got control of its borders and during the pandemic said, eh, we're not going to take you. And that closed off a lot of people, particularly to Asia. Now, some people don't know this, but if you look at Western Canada, there are a very large number of native speaking Asians who've moved in, but they're instead going toward the United States. Now, if you happen to know about how to take advantage of immigration, I want to talk to you about, well, some of the things you want to know. Birth rates alone are not sufficient in the United States to take care of the demand for employment. I don't entirely understand why, except to say that I know it is true. Now, the influx of non-native United States residents is likely to increase dramatically in the next two or three years. We're going to get a lot more immigrants in the United States that speak other languages. We have the capacity to take those people and employ them and to allow them to keep their income. So that in itself right there is a big reason why people are likely to come. You must choose your immigrant population to make this part of your practice plan, to make it successful. Now, ultimately, as I'll explain in a minute, there are parts of the country that are going to do this much more than in others. Now, a few things you have to know about the people who are moving in. Five things that I think you need to know. One is their country of origin, obviously, but the language of their place of origin is particularly important. Now, remember, India has many, many languages, well, at least five that are significant. If you look at other parts of the world, they have local languages that they speak, and you have to know them in order to take advantage of the population that's coming. Now, the culture of the place of origin is different from the language of the place of origin. Knowing that just because a person happens to be from a place doesn't mean that you know their culture. Now, I know a little bit about the Hmong population. That's H-M-O-N-G, in case you're wondering. They're an ethnically Chinese population that's lived in the mountains of Laos. And after Vietnam and Cambodia, a lot of them came to the United States. Now, they're not all the same. And there are only uh, just a few last names. And if you, you're not allowed to marry a person who has the same last name, as far as their culture is concerned, that's considered incest. You identify the Hmong countries by an article of clothing that the women wear. There's the green Mongs and the red Mongs and the plaid Mongs, and they are of different ethnicities, slightly different accents, and they don't like to intermarry. Knowing that helps you if you have an area that where there's significant Hmong people. This is true of a lot of places in Asia. Now, how do you overcome the challenge? Well, if you've got a staff who is from the place of origin, that's your number one means of recruiting people to be native speakers to the new population that's moved in. Are you going to put up a sign that says, hey, yeah, Afghans, welcome? No, you're going to probably hire a key Afghan speaker, and they're going to be the person who will be the entree person to come in. Now, there are certain gateway cities that are much more popular with some countries and native, uh, nations and cultures of origin than others. You have to know what these are. Now, let me give you a quick test. Seattle. Who is coming into Seattle? Seattle, by the way, is one of the biggest importers or gateways, if you will, of Chinese people in the world. It's Seattle. If we look at Los Angeles, well, yeah, you typically would say, yeah, Mexico, but you also want to take into account El Salvador. Now, El Salvador was already a huge population, and their government basically fell apart, and people started coming to Los Angeles. Boston is one of the key gateway cities of European nations, but this is also going to be true of several countries in, it's not the Middle East, if you will. Greeks, for example, will come through Boston. If you want to hire an Irishman, you head toward Boston. 
So there are gateway cities that are particularly large with certain groups. Houston is an example of a city that has gotten a lot of Hmongs, for example. Being on the Gulf of Mexico, a lot of people who were the the Laotian boat people made Houston their place where they wanted to start. Washington, D.C. has a large number of Hispanics. Now, for some reason, they didn't realize that El Salvador and Guatemala were using Washington, D.C. as a gateway community. Miami, of course, is very big with the islands in the Caribbean. And so, of course, you already know about Little Havana. But do you know that Argentina has a large number of people who are coming into Miami? If you went to Minneapolis, you'll notice a lot of Asians have used that. And that's one reason why so many meatpackers have gone to Miami, because they've got people who can work in the industry and love doing it. Chicago is a different population. Dallas, Culver City, again, an Asian center. Now, I bring up Salt Lake City and some people who don't know Utah are, what? Salt Lake City? Yeah. Well, Salt Lake City is the second biggest Tongan city in the world. There are more people from the Pacific Islands who've moved to Utah than in almost any other place in the United States. And right now, they're not doing as well in Hawaii as they are in the United States. Atlanta, Brooklyn. Now, let me just say one quick thing about Brooklyn. You already know that Israel has a very close association with Brooklyn. You know that Israeli politicians go and give speeches and raise money in Brooklyn, New York, much more than they are in other parts of the country. So don't be too surprised by it. Now, San Francisco is a major Asian city, but there are other countries that use San Francisco as a gateway community. That's what I'm just trying to sensitize to you, that if you happen to be one of those cities... Keep an eye out for it. But there are new gateway cities opening up in the United States. The low-hanging fruit is the knowledge of the population who is moving into your area. Each culture has unique clinical mandates. It's not as though they're all going to want and need the same thing. However, there are some cultures that will look at stainless steel crowns as cutting edge. They like it. They like the fact that you're going to have restorations that are obvious. That is something in their cultures that they may like. Children are often the ambassadors of the immigrant parents. So as almost all school leaders know, a child can learn English very quickly, and they often will be the ones who will make the phone calls to an office or bring their parents and grandparents to the office and translate for the immigrants. Older people just don't learn languages as easily and as quickly. So I want you to be aware that you have to consider children to be an important part of building up your immigrant patient base. Five years is a rough estimate of acculturation. Now, I'm not saying that after five years, everything's hunky-dory and there's no problem. I'm just saying five years is usually the time frame that people take to become familiar enough with a place to get a doctor for their treatment. Nobody gets off the boat or the plane and says, quick, take me to the dentist or take me to the physician. It takes about five years for that. A second city is a natural pattern after 10 years of the first generation's arrival. So after an immigrant population will live in the United States for about 10 years, they'll consider going to their second city. There is a close association with family members who already speak English or are at least acculturized that they will then go to live with their family member as those people will have more opportunities to get jobs, to buy homes, and to get out of the area. Home ownership is the most common immigrant aspiration. It isn't a car, and they can actually get jobs in a large number of industries. But I'll tell you, home ownership is the holy grail. To have a piece of America, that's what people want. If you recognize the very low-end place that might be close to your office where the immigrant population are moving and buying, boy, you're home free. So if you have Serbo-Croatians, for example, which doesn't sound very big to you, but the Serbs are kind of an interesting group that stick together. They are going to buy their homes, almost all of them, right next door to each other. The same thing happens with almost every immigrant population. And generally, 10 years after their arrival is when it happens. Now, I'm going to say something that is entirely self-serving, or at least you might think so. If you want to know how to take advantage of an immigrant population, hire a Mormon. You may say, why would I hire a Mormon? Well, for one thing, a large number of Mormon or LDS 
Youth serve missions, men and women both, and they learn languages and live overseas for a couple of years. They know the people, they like the people, and the people like them. So I'm just saying one of the ways that you take advantage of this is to hire someone who is has the language, but also has the culture and is a friendly, open person. Unfortunately, there's not enough Mormon kids to go around who are return missionaries. I'm just saying. Now, you could also hire a foreign trained doctor. There are lots and lots of doctors from around the world who've been trained, but they can't get their license to become a doctor, a physician, a dentist, an optometrist, or whatever. However, they often will make a wonderful addition to your practice because they tend to work for a little less and they're motivated to keep within the industry that they've been working in. They are a gateway or an opportunity to build that group. Now, immigrants, I want you to understand, have some unique media tastes. So if you want to promote your practice to them, listen to me. The Three Stooges. Now, you may be going, the Three Stooges? They are a worldwide phenomenon. They've all been dead for a very long period of time, but their their work has been translated. It's very slapstick, very blue collar, and they're very popular. Now, I'm just bringing this up as an example. There are several programs that have made that transition. But radio is perhaps your best media investment because it's very inexpensive to set up a culture-based radio station. What a lot of stations do is they will broadcast in one language for two hours during the day, maybe three, and then switch over to a different language. That is the most inexpensive way to reach a large number of people in the immigrant population that you're trying to hook. Radio. You want to know more? Contact Dr. Demographics for a marketing report and we'll help you out. All right. It is cheap and it is local. Uh, So I'm just saying reach a lot of people in particular culture inexpensively. Radio is what I recommend. Let us know how we can help. Now, even if there is a limited language in Serbo-Croatian as an example, there are some radio stations that are national. Actually, they're internet based and they're remarkably popular, and everybody tunes in. They're national, and yet you can buy a local contract to say, I'm the local optometrist in this area who's on this Serb station. Trust me, it'll save your bacon. They are outstandingly loyal to these media outlets. Outstandingly. The older they get, the more loyal they are. Now, if you want to learn more about what Dr. Demographics does and how we can help you to get a new population to come into your practice, please call me at 833-424-6222 or look us up on the web at drdemographics.com. I just want to say in conclusion, sometimes your best opportunity is to look for a new patient base that is growing but does not already have professionals in your industry to serve them. Oh, you may not think they have as much money, and they may live in kind of a poor part of town, but trust me, if you want to find the perfect place to put a practice, sometimes you have to think a little bit outside the box, and the large immigrant population that is coming to America is a good way to start. Thanks so much for watching.